Hey everybody, I'm Sammy Wang. I'm a realtor and um, I'm super excited to have Shiva and Shiva Baskar and Fiona Bryan. Um, we have each done workshops separately about lending, about credit, and today we're basically just going to put the masterminds together and talk about how to improve your credit, specifically in the context of real estate, like buying real estate, investing in real estate, because um, it tends to be most people have are trying to buy a house and then realize they need to do some credit work. And so then we're always kind of talking to each other, the three of us. So we figured, hey, let's share some nuggets um, of wisdom from what we've learned and just kind of like the basics of improving your credit, credit and lending and how that all works together to invest in real estate. So Shiva, go ahead and introduce yourself and Fiona and, and then yourself. we'll dive in kind of maybe share like, what do you do and why? Why did you get into okay. it? Sure. So my name is Shiva Baskar and I am a consumer credit repair attorney with tier one credit. So we're based here in Los Angeles and we help people with a few things, uh, mainly building and improving and managing their credit. And in particular, repairing credit in, in terms of removing damaging or derogatory negative items from the credit report. And we work with folks in not just locally, but around the country. Um, in fact, a lot of our business is out of state. And uh, the, we have a unique model in terms of, we really focus first on how someone can build credit. And we only charge based on negative items we're able to delete, which is unusual for the industry where most companies charge a monthly recurring fee while you work with them. So that's sort of a different approach. And why I got into it, in part due to my personal experiences coming out of law school and having a lot of student loan debt and making some late payments on it and dealing with a lot of those issues as a result. So much later that seeing my own credit damage and what I had to do to, to, to improve it kind of set me on this journey towards helping other people do the same. And we started our company almost five years ago, roughly. And uh, yeah, it's been, been a fun ride since and really enjoy what we do and excited. I think with things going on in the economy, whether it's interest rates or obviously there's a lot of concerns about, you know, where things are headed. Certainly things have been very busy from our end in terms of folks who need help. And there's a lot, there's continuous changes in the credit reporting space. So we're always staying on top of that as well. Awesome. Thanks, Shiva. And Fiona, tell us about you. Yes. Hi, I am Fiona Bryan. I am uh, a California licensed loan originator with um, Academy Mortgage. So I essentially help people when they're purchasing their homes in helping to strategize the loan and um, have a particular interest in first time home buyers and um, oftentimes, you know, the first time somebody realizes the impact on some things on their credit is when they actually go and they have their FICO score pulled because we're pulling in three different credit bureaus and there we take the mid score. So there'll be a high, a low and a mid score. And um, that's the score we use uh, basically to determine what, what type of risk you are from a lending standpoint. So that can affect your interest rate. It can affect your qualifying. And um, we can talk a little bit about, you know, what the minimum qualifying for um, different types of loans. You know, for example, if you're doing an FHA loan, um, we can do, you know, as low as a 580 score. There are some lenders that will do a 540. And there are non-QM lenders who actually don't really care about your credit score. But <laughs> if you can pay their interest rates, they're happy to loan you money. Um, and then for, you know, for in general, the, the, the best interest rate, the best terms are really going to come for those who have a credit score at about 720. 680 to 720. Um, I usually will encourage people if we're not actively looking for a home to um, maybe look at some tips to improve their score. Um, and, and that can really impact the outcome um, in terms of the type of interest rate and, and 
what we end up locking into. So I think that everybody really deserves the opportunity to learn about what it is that creditors are looking at, how they're treating you, and what it means when you have a late payment or what it means when you really are fighting that company um, and, and, you know, on principle are not going to make that payment. Um, it, it's a calculated decision sometimes, and sometimes it's not fair. And so I think, you know, I love to do um, webinars like this because I think that, you know, sometimes consumers are left out in the dark. Like, what are my rights? What can I do? And um, so many times I'll send somebody to Shiva and, and maybe it's, we can help you. And maybe it's, well, we need a little, little bit of time pass and that's just how it is. And so I think though that um, knowledge is power. And so I'm super happy that we're doing this and can talk about it in the context of real estate. Awesome. Yes. No, I love it. Um, I think that's the main takeaway is, you know, I, <clears throat> I got into real estate also because I was an educator for uh, over 10 years and just kind of like looked up that career ladder and was like, man, 35 more years. <laughs> I'm kind of like, I was like, I'm already tired. Um, so, you know, real estate for me was like all about financial freedom and you know, I just like learned all these tools and then started applying them. And now I'm just like, well, we should really democratize this. Like people should know how things work so that, cause now, you know, was, I really just had to learn a whole new language and now I'm just trying to share that with people. So um, that's why I love working with uh, Shiva and Fiona. And I mean, I guess, you know, there were some questions that people put in, but I guess, you know, I would say, maybe Shiva start us off with like, what do people, I mean, Fiona, you already mentioned it a little bit, like how credit is seen from a lending perspective, but like in the context of real estate, what do people need to do to work on their credit? Like, do they need to have an 800? Like what, when someone comes to you Shiva and wants to buy a house, like what are you doing? What's like the most strategic kind of quickest way to get people where they need to be? Sure. So the first thing that we would look at, the fastest way to improve your credit score, if it's not where you want it to be, the first thing that we would typically look at is credit card balances. Uh, and when I say balances, I mean what was reported as of the last time that they generated a credit report and they pulled the credit, because that number is going to determine a big chunk of your score. If you look at your FICO score, there's five factors that determine it. And those are payment history, the amount of debt you have, the age of your credit accounts, the mix of accounts, and then credit inquiries. And right after payment history is amount of debt. And they care a lot more about your credit card or revolving debt than they do about your installment debt uh, for a variety of reasons. And so making sure that your credit card balances in total are under 30%, ideally no more than one to 5% of your total limits. And I actually had a call with someone the other day. I referred to Fiona, funny enough, they talked to them last night, like late. Uh, I was a friend of a friend, so we agreed to do it. But basically their score was a little lower than they wanted. And it turns out it's just because they have one credit card with a high balance because they had a bunch of spending the previous month and they, they always pay it off, but they had just gone and bought a bunch of stuff and that's what it was. And so I told him, listen, pay this down and then you can look into a refinance. And so paying down credit card balances is number one. That's, that's the fastest way to improve it. After that, we have to look at derogatory items on the credit report. And that can take a good amount longer depending on what there is. It's, it's definitely not an overnight process. It, it can move fast depending on what you have, but um, the most severe cases where the scores are under 600 and they have repossessions and a lot of collections and credit card charges, it can take a while. But always look at the credit card balances first because if you can reduce those, or even if you can't reduce it, but you could get someone else to add you as an authorized user to their credit card, they don't have to give you the card, but just getting your name on there can help you as well to increase your overall credit limits, assuming they don't have a big balance. And then if your overall limits go up, then even if your previous balances were high, the ratio might go down, which means your score increases. So that's another strategy as well. 
And, and Shiva, just, you know, when we talk about credit card balances too, I think there's, there's some confusion about, you know, total credit available, what percentage is used, and, and the percentage used in each individual credit card. So what people don't realize when they get pulled into that 10% discount and they sign up for the old Navy card that has a $300 limit on it, if you put a hundred bucks on it, <laughs> You're, yeah. yeah, it's just that $300, it does not help you. <laughs> you may have saved 10%, but. Yep. <laughs> that, that, yeah. is, that is very true. I think the composition of your cards, to Fiona's point, is a big issue. And I see that specific situation so often, it's unbelievable. Maybe, They'll have like all maybe, those come yeah. bank and Synchrony yeah. Bank, right? And sometimes I have to wonder how those companies make money because if I tell you the amount of Synchrony mm -hmm. Bank and Covendi Bank accounts, if I, if I go in our email right now and see how many emails I have with the attorneys for that company, it's unbelievable. So point being, those store cards are often the first things to go. Um, so, you know, if you, you don't need really, ideally you'll have three open active lines of credit, at least on your credit report when you're applying. If, if you have less, it can be a thin file. It could be shaky. If you have more, that's great. But so if all you have is credit cards, at least three of them, if you have a student loans or something, then maybe fewer credit cards is fine. But having at least several open active accounts with good standing is important, yeah. Right, because as a lender, what we're actually looking at is not like the overall debt, it's the monthly impact of that debt, right? So you may have a $30,000 credit card and the monthly payment is only $100. So that feels like a lot of credit, or sorry, a lot of debt. And so people will be like, oh, I have $30,000 or well, 30 is a lot, but it, whatever that balance is, what we really are looking at is what the monthly payment is, because that is what's going to count against your debt to income. So it also can it can impact, you know, how much you're qualifying for, not just you know, not just the score itself, but that balance. Um, so so really, you know, the idea of, you know, having those three credit lines and making sure that you know you're not that you're using you're using them so that that monthly minimum isn't going to hit and take up so much space that it it means you can buy ten thousand dollars less of a house yeah right right that is very true that is so true and the and keep in mind that credit card interest rates are only going up um mm -hmm. and that has a pretty dramatic impact i mean you can buy borrow a mortgage in the low five percent but credit card debt's a lot more expensive um you know, and I can speak from personal experience because I've had it before. So, you know, north of, I mean, 15%, 20%, up to 29.99, they can be very high and uh, it can cost you a lot of money. Um, obviously, circumstances vary, so it's not always possible to maybe pay all of it off. But one thing I will say, anyone who has high credit card balances, meaning you've got a good amount of credit card debt, but your payment history is good, right? So your your credit score might not be perfect because you do have a lot of credit card debt, but maybe you have a 640 or a 650 or something in that range because you don't really have anything bad on there like late payments or collections. You just have high debt. One thing you could do is get a debt consolidation loan or a personal loan and use that to pay it off because those loans, if your credit's into six somethings, those loans might come with 10 or 12% interest, but that's a lot cheaper than the credit card interest. You can use it to pay off the cards and then repay that loan, which is obviously is cheaper money because it's a lower rate. So that's a good strategy. And I, I don't, obviously I don't recommend this if your score is under 640. Like if you've got derogatories on the report, it's not a good idea. But if you just have high credit card debt, I think we're probably in one of the last months where you're going to lock in personal loans at a good rate still, because the rates have already gone up a lot. But you can still save compared to credit cards for sure. That's a good strategy too. Yeah, and and that's the other thing is um, I, I, anybody who is who shows good use of credit, right? So automatically paying off all of your credit cards right away actually doesn't benefit you as much as getting them down to manageable place, right? Is am I correct? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's I what I notice is that really, really we're not looking for no debt. We're looking for how you use the debt, 
Like, how are you utilizing your debt? I've also actually helped people um, who, you know, were just trying to get to a certain um, magical number. And the way that we do that is they're great users of credit. They called up their bank and they had the credit line risen. The minute they rose that credit limit, we got right over. I mean, we really only need like five points to get over this magic number. And the way that we did it was by raising the credit limit, not by paying down the debt. So it's, it's really, I feel like there should be some kind of like user manual for, for personal credit because nobody understands how it works. I don't even fully understand it myself, but I, I know that there are, there are ways that we should be teaching people um, what, what their actions and, and what they can and, and should, should and shouldn't do because sometimes it's contrary to what you would think. I have a question. Oh, Sophia, please. Uh, is, is it, are we allowed to like ask questions? Of course. Questions. Okay. Of course. That's why we're here. Um, that actually was a question of mine because I get those emails. That's like, or when I log in and it's like, um, increase your credit or, you know, increase your credit limit, put in your new income. And I, it's almost like counterintuitive. Like, is that going to actually help my situation? But I guess from what Fiona's saying is when you do that, then your credit to like, you, you have less debt, but because all of a sudden your limit went up. So how does that affect your credit it, score? Is that so a good thing or? It's a very good thing. If you're assuming your income went up and they, and they increase your credit limit, then that's a really good thing because if you have more available credit, I mean, it's positive, not because you plan on using it, but it shows that you're trusted enough by the lender that they would give you a higher limit. So that, yeah, for sure, Sophia, if, if uh, you know, if the income has increased compared to when you reported it, because if you opened a card three years ago or four years ago and the income is higher, which it probably is, then, you know, it, you want your limit to reflect that. I mean, I have two, I have a card with Capital One and another one with Amex that I opened several years ago. And both of them have a limit of only, not only, but a limit of 5,000. And I was looking and I was like, geez, like I should call these guys up and ask them to increase it. Thing is, I don't really use either of those cards. So I mean, but I could kind of be like, hey, I'll use it a little bit, maybe if uh, <laughs> if you increase the limit. And one thing to keep in mind also, Fiona mentioned earlier, it's not about having zero balances because I was actually at a seminar, uh, one of the credit, you know, attorney and credit repair company events uh, a couple of years ago. And they had someone from FICO presenting. And she was saying that if you have 0% balances, across all your credit cards, your FICO score is actually slightly lower compared to someone who has one to 5%. Because the way it looks if they see someone with 0% is basically that you have these credit cards, you stuck them in a drawer in your house, you don't use them. You're not really managing credit, you just have a few cards versus someone who uses it a little bit and pays it on time and pays it off. So, yeah. I'm going to quote you on that and uh, raise my limit, go shopping just a little bit. So I, uh, exactly. <laughs> so I can, uh, good idea. Hard. <laughs> Grab an extra pair of shoes. Yeah. For my credit score. <laughs> I did it for the credit score, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it's not, it's like always try to increase your credit limits and then basically treat if you can in that scenario, treat your credit cards like a debit card. Um, but even if you do have existing debt, yeah, just finding ways. And that's the other thing is like having people who can advise you to, you know, get over a certain hurdle or not just say like, no, we can't because of your credit, but, oh, call up your, you know, credit card company and raise the limit or do this or do that. So um, are there any other kind of like hacks, I guess, that people could, you know, because it sounds like there's a few different categories of people. There's like, if you have items on your credit that you need removed, that's like call Shiva, like let, you know, work to get those things taken off. But like the, then there's also just like managing debt. There's, we're going to talk about student loans too. That's like another piece is, mm -hmm. you know, everybody got student loans. So I don't know if you want to go there yet, but. Um, I think, I think when it comes to managing debt, the biggest thing, Here's the reality. I, I was reading an article, I forgot, maybe it was in the Wall Street Journal or US News the other day, like credit card usage and balances and people taking on riskier loans is going through the roof right now, okay? Mm -hmm. 
which tells me that the moment the economy slows down, which it will probably sooner than later, but that's not here or there, all of those things will go south. I mean, you, I, I know people who are in my business in 2009 and 10, and I don't, I literally don't think they could hire people fast enough at that time because of the amount of um, stuff that was going on. But the point is, whenever you take on debt, consider what will happen if you lose your job, if something dramatic happens to your income. Um, you know, because I mean, those things happen. And the reality is, I think maybe a lot of us, I mean, aside from COVID, have been a little bit lulled by the fact that the economy has been more or less on an upward slope for the past 12, 13 years. We all know that that's not going to last forever. And I just think with debt, you just want it to be manageable in the sense, hey, if if I was if I were not working for three months or six months or something else happened, how would I pay these accounts? What would happen? And for a lot of us, unfortunately, the answer is that you would lose a lot of those things um, or you'd have trouble paying it. And that's totally natural because not every job pays like crazy. But I think just thinking about how to manage it is wise because um, that way, when something happens, you might be able to get through it a little more smoothly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I see a lot in the like financial independence, financial health world of like, you know, do you, if you have some money or you're saving money, like, do you pay down debt? Do you save up for a down payment? Do you invest? Like, how, what, you know, and I, I obviously these are all kind of personal choices, but it's sort of a macro question of like, what do you do? What do you do first? I mean, I think one of the first things is to sort of save up that buffer period of mm -hmm. a few, like I would rather someone have some debt and like three months savings than no debt. <laughs> no and debt I think any financial, any financial planner that we, we should have a financial planner in here too. <laughs> uh, you know, any, any planner is probably going to tell you the same thing that, you know, you need to have that buffer because you, you know, it, we're all, what do they say? We're all one accident away from, from, you know, disaster. And so a lot of times I'll see medical debt. And actually one of the interesting things is that that is the one um, collection that we do not require um, people to pay. So, and it actually, if I'm correct, Shiva, aren't those being pulled off of the FICO reports coming up here soon? Some are. So, some are the ones. The ones under five hundred dollars will no longer appear on your credit reports. Unpaid ones. Any paid medical collection will be removed starting in July of this year, okay. and then starting, I think, April or somewhere in there next year, all the ones under five hundred won't count. I mean. They'll count towards your FICO score, but you may still be paid able to get though, it. correct? Yeah. They'll still show yeah. up if they're unpaid. Yeah. 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 So and that's charge offs sure. will always stay on there as well. People are always like, yeah, but I paid it. <laughs> Does, Did you yeah, talk about that, you know, Shiva, if you pay off a pay yeah. off a collection? Well, it's better. It's better to so here's the thing. The mortgage FICO scores still count paid collections. A lot of the FICO scores still count paid collections because you still did. I mean, to go into collections, the debt has to be at least three to six months delinquent, you know, mm -hmm. and particularly with credit cards and other things. I mean, it has to be a consistent pattern of non-payment, right, mm -hmm. for that to happen. So those will be on there. And a lot of people say, well, if it's paid, I would say it's better than unpaid in the sense, if it's unpaid, it's reporting every month fresh. If it's paid, it's not reporting freshly, it's aging off, its impact is subsiding a little. You do want to get it removed, which is one of the things we do in the credit repair process, but it's better paid than unpaid. But one thing to keep in mind also, people have charged off credit cards and they call and they call like, okay, Capital One or Synchrony, because those are two of the ones that go bad the most often. And they say, hey, can you, can, if I pay you, can you remove it? The answer is always no. And the reason why is because there's an agreement between the credit agencies like Experian and Equifax and these companies not to remove them in exchange for payment. So they'll mark it paid. But if you want it removed, you have to use other tactics, um, usually after it's paid in the case of charge offs. You know, with collections, you may not have to pay it to get it removed, but with, with charge offs, yeah. So, one thing to keep in mind, because we've had a lot of clients who, people who call our office and we're like, hey, you have to settle those charge offs and we can work on removing it. And some of them are like, oh, no worries. I'm just going to call the credit card company and just get them to delete it and then I'll be good. So, we're like, okay, sure, call them, <laughs> be my guest. Um, maybe they'll agree. 
but most times they don't and they call us back and they're like hey i paid it but they're refusing to remove it and so we're like okay well there's a legal process then so yeah so i've also read and i don't know if this is true but is there there isn't Oh, you just said that. Never mind. You just said that it's you can't say to them, I'll pay it if you remove it. There's no agreement that you can come to. With some small collection agencies, maybe not with any of the big ones. No. The thing the thing that's a little bit interesting to me is that we, we'll see things where it says the consumer disputes it. And if there's an open dispute, I mean, how, it, how is that fair? If they're disputing it and they're saying this is not legitimate, I don't owe this. Do I? Why do I have to pay it in order to protect? Well, if they, if they really don't owe it, if they really don't owe it, the law protects them. They can dispute it with the credit bureaus and then sue them. Okay, and we've done those lawsuits. Like you can sue Experian, you can sue Equifax. They get sued. I think Experian had about six. Experian alone probably had at least six thousand lawsuits against them in federal court last year. You can sue them. The issue is what people think is unfair versus what is illegal. I think there's a big gap. Mm. Like something might seem unfair and not nice, but it's perfectly legal. I mean, you know, Sammy and I working in real estate, it's totally legal in a lot of states to raise someone's rent by 100%. It might not seem fair, but it's okay. The same thing, unfortunately, applies when it comes to credit reporting. Like them, you know, you had auto pay and your auto pay didn't work and you were marked late. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you may have a case, but very often, ultimately, it was your responsibility to pay the account, and you didn't. Um, it was auto pay that did it, and I agree it's unfair, but that's a situation where, okay, you, you wouldn't be able to sue them over it, right? I do think also, too, that's a situation where if you're proactive and you call, because this has happened to me before, where I've caught it, it's been, you know, I've been like, oh, I didn't notice it. I call them. I tell them I'm paying it right now. I do it while I'm on the phone. And they give me a courtesy removal of that late and the late fee. They will, and they will sometimes, yeah. they really will. It, it depends heavily on the company. I mean, like certain ones are more flexible than others. I mean, Chase or Bank of America if, or Wells Fargo, if you have one of those, it's like, no. honestly, it's, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, even on a credit repair standpoint, those Bank of America and Chase, like if it's on there, we're pretty, we're pretty much like, hey, listen, you're just going to have to let it age because there's really no human way to remove those things. <laughs> um, but other ones, yeah, you can call them. But the biggest thing is just, I think logging into your bank account every month right. um, is one good thing because if you have a list of all your credit obligations, like, okay, you, you know, you, I don't know, you have a mortgage, you got an auto loan, you got student loans, you've got three credit cards. If you know what those are, you can check and make sure that those are being withdrawn or you know what the dates are. And if you see that, hey, Capital One was supposed to auto pay on the 13th and it didn't, then, you know, you can go into Capital One and check what happened and get ahead of it. So I think you don't need to go in every account. You just need to know every account you have, have them on your calendar and check your bank account. And mm -hmm. if anything on there has not deducted that should have according to the dates you have, the due dates, then, uh, then you know something is wrong and you should contact them. So I'm yeah. totally obsessed with this new app. And I know Rocket just bought them. So now I'm I'm like, oh, do I really like them that much? So Truebill, and it's all over TikTok. You've seen all the ads, everything. I randomly checked it out. I have been looking for something that pipes 100% of everything I do into one little app. And it actually does it. And it even, they don't even have a standard charge for it, the monthly on the, this app. And it just says, you know, what is it worth to you? And they recommend like $7. I was like, oh my God, this is totally worth $7 just to me. Just having everything in one place. Um, because it also alerts me every time I get a payment or every time I have an auto pay being, you know, created. It also tells me when my bills are due. Um, so that sounds like an, an advertisement for Truebill, but um, but it, it truly, no, no. having yeah, everything in one place was amazing. Uh -huh. It's been amazing, yeah. Yeah, whatever works for people. Like, I mean, I I just go spreadsheet because I want to track every penny. I every you know month, I kind of look at my download my credit card statements and just kind of like tag everything and see what I'm spending every month, how much I'm getting in investment income versus you know expenses. But um, you know, because I'm on that like financial independence track, but people use like mint or Truebill, like, but what, it doesn't matter what you do. The lesson is yeah. check your accounts every month. And um, yeah, just like do like a quick inventory of like, oh, like 
where's my bank accounts? Where's my mm-hmm. investment accounts? Where's my debt? Like just a quick um, glance. Cause I think that it can get really, you know, it can get stressful or overwhelming. overwhelming. And then it's like, I don't know, I have payments, but I don't want to look at them. And honestly, part of it is just like, all right, <laughs> let's look at everything and make sure that you're at least seeing what you're spending. Like, you know, cause that's what I tell a lot of people when they're buying a house, I'm like, look, you got to start thinking about what you want to spend. It's usually in Los Angeles going to cost more to buy than to rent. I mean, some people obviously are renting like super expensive places, but generally rents are a little bit less in LA than mortgages. So no matter what, it's going to be a stretch, but it's like, you have to figure out like, I'm not really one who makes a budget. Like I don't make a future budget. I more look at, it's easy for me to just look at what did I spend last month? Oh, okay. Maybe I want to spend a little bit less here, a little more there. So I sort of do like a a look back, um, but just seeing it is helpful. And Mm -hmm. some people really are good with like setting, you know, budgets for themselves for the future. But no matter what, it's um, because you are really thinking about like that monthly obligation. I mean, Fiona, if you want to share a little bit more about like debt to income, and that's like one of the main mindset shifts, I think, for buying a house is like, it's not the total of everything. It's Mm -hmm. really just looking at the monthly um and you're kind of locking in that monthly payment um but i don't know if you want to share more about like how yeah so, so one of the one of the ways that we determine how much you qualify for or what it so what you know fannie mae and freddie mac have determined is appropriate for someone to spend on housing actually pulls in all of your debt. So that includes your car payment, your minimums on your your credit cards. It includes your student loan payments, even if they're at zero right now. <laughs> we we take the balance of that student loan um, and we actually, for, for Fannie Mae, we, we counted at 1% of the balance is the monthly payment. Um, Freddie Mac will allow us uh, actually 0.5 percent so or half a percent so but we are looking at all of that and then on top of that we're adding in okay what is your new monthly payment going to be and that you know you know Fannie Mae will allow us oftentimes to go up to 50 percent of your income um you know in a in a really expensive area like here where our loan sizes are getting bigger and bigger it's the lower your debt to income ratio the better the interest rate um, the better the terms, it's just, it's, it, and the more comfortable you are, right? Because if you're using 50% of your income every month and, you know, and that's, that's literally all we're tracking, that doesn't include what you're eating, what you're spending in cash, you know, all of that kind of stuff that, that actually gets to be a little bit overwhelming. So, so I think that, you know, if you, if you took, you know, any one month, where you're, you're putting in your groceries, all of the stuff that's not on your credit cards, like how much money are you spending that's not on credit cards? It kind of adds up. So that debt to income um, includes all those things. And, and that's really where we determine, you know, what you're going to qualify for. But not only that, but, you know, at, at what point is it too risky for the lender to allow you to purchase this home with this loan? That's kind of what that what that does. And, and actually this might be a good segue into student loans. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and one comment I want to make on that is a lender is taking your gross income um, to qualify your DTI. So, tax. And that's a, an interesting gap, right? Because if you have a W-2, you're not seeing your gross income put into your bank account every mm-hmm. month. You're seeing your net income, right? So, but the, but the DTI, the debt to income ratio is based off your growth so that's why i'm always like look go get pre-approved but look at the monthly payment and see does that work for me and maybe we bring down where you want to be in purchase price because that monthly payment is based off your growth which like 50 percent of your gross income I mean, that would be like a huge amount before of taxes, money. because a lot of us are paying like 20 to 30% in taxes, before taxes, before you're health taking money out for your 401k. Before 401k. Yeah. So I really, you know, like, I'm really 
trying to get people like down <laughs> instead of up, um, you know, counterintuitive as a realtor, but that's kind of like the investing background is like, you really want to be looking at your monthly payment. Um, and then it's also hard to like, know what your, what a good monthly payment is going to be if you have like no idea what you're spending. Cause your only frame of reference is what's your monthly rent. But if usually the mortgage is going to be more than that, but how much more? And if you just don't know, you know, if yeah. your credit cards and you're not tracking, it's a little bit hard. So, and anyway, I do have to say one of the things I'm super proud about what, you know, you Sammy, you and I have done is that we've really taken the conversation of what's comfortable um, really seriously with our, with our borrowers. Um, and, and I work with a lot of realtors and, and not all of them do because the more someone spends, the more that realtor makes. And I think that, you know, the long game though, is we want to get you into the market. We want you to stay in the market and we want you to buy more houses. <laughs> right. Yeah, like if you buy a house with me and then you lose your house in the recession, right? like how is that? Or you're completely part? miserable because you can do nothing else, but pay your, your house payment. Yeah. That's no good. We want you to have good quality of life, but, yeah. but yeah. It, and, and I think, you know, again, that, that gross income is, is such an important, you know, thing to remember. I'll, I'll ask people in our first conversation, you know, what's your rent? Well, where do you feel a, you know, comfortable housing payment would be? And, and they're like, well, what do I qualify for? And I'm like, well, I'm going to tell you what you qualify for. <laughs> but what I want to know in that first conversation before they have any kind of concept of what they actually do qualify for is what is comfortable because 99 times out of a hundred, they qualify for significantly more, more. than in their yeah. mind they feel is comfortable. And it's always better to reel out than to reel in because once you've looked mm -hmm. at that $900,000 house with oh, yeah. fancy shoes on it, <laughs> it's much harder to, to take a step back. Um, and it's a process. And I always tell people, I'm like, trust the process. <laughs> yeah, totally. Very yeah. True. Yeah. And, and Shiva, you know, I, I, you know, just kudos to you and, and just to kind of give you guys a shout out the people that you referred us to. I mean, I would have never known there was a, a credit issue at all. Like th those, those credit reports come in, they're beautiful. I'm like, why is Shiva referring me? There's this problem to have. There's no problems here. Hey, you saw them before. <laughs> that, and that's our, that's one of the things that we find is that a lot of people want to know, Hey, who's good to work with. And we have found, I used to give someone's name much earlier in the process, but the issue was consistent, like, okay, I have a bunch of people in Florida and we have a couple loan officers we know there, but the issue was consistently, the moment they got the name, it was sort of like, oh, well, there's someone who could lend me. It's not saying, hey, when your credit is better, this person will do a loan. People, folks are sort of hearing, oh, they'll do a loan right now. And then the lender would pull their credit and they'd be like, oh, I'm still working with him. And he'd be like, oh, well, why don't we wait till that's done? So now I'm like, yeah, because I, I specifically, I know one that you're referring to. Uh, yeah. They they were asking us for for that 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 referral when they first signed up. And we were like, no, no, let's get this uh, in order. And it's very gratifying because for a lot of people, just psychologically, if you got turned that's down for loans before and then we give you someone and they turn you down again, it's just going to be frustrating versus let's get everything in order. It's going to take some time and then you're going to go do it. You're going to feel a lot better. So, yeah, no, I, that, yeah, that's, it's great. I mean, because it's just, um, and, you know, everybody deserves to own a home and everybody deserves, you know, the ability to, um, to prove that they, they can and should. So I think that's, that's amazing. So student loans. Okay. Well, yeah, we got off track. Huh? Okay. So student loans. So, oh, student loans. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of defaulted student loans. We haven't probably seen them as much lately, Shiva, because they've all been deferred. But um, so for a lender, your stu student loans, some of them seem very huge to people. Um, and they're overwhelming. And, and the first time I talk to somebody, they're like, yeah, I have all these student loans. And sometimes it can be problematic um, if there are a lot of them. But if if you've you know sort of managed them well, you're okay. Even now with deferment, if they're at zero, um, again, we're doing about 1% of the total balance is what we're gonna pull and count towards the debt to income ratio for, um, for a monthly payment. And if you are on an income-driven repayment program, we're going to take whatever 
the lender gives us for your monthly payment. Um, if you're on um, any kind of special payment program, we're gonna we're gonna take those. If they're in deferment right now, if they're if they're at zero, and um, you have forbearance on those loans, we we can't do that. You're gonna have to go back and activate them, get them into payment mode, and then we can use the income driven um, repayment plan. Um, as far as defaulted student loans. Um, Shiva, have you, can you comment on that and, and how those sort of, how you treat those? Of course. So with a defaulted student loan, which basically means that it was not paid for a certain period of time, um, typically six months, I believe, so that it, you know, was defaulted. There's a process called rehabilitation by which you could bring the loan current. And basically what it, what rehabilitation refers to is that the you go tell the lender, hey, I want to rehabilitate the loan. And this is what I, what I, the part I'm saying now is assuming that student loans were not in deferment. Okay, like right now those payments are zero. But if you were if you were defaulted, you'd go to the lender and say, listen, I want to take these out of default. And what they'll typically do is have you make payments a redu a dramatically reduced amount of payment amount because they'll look at the what's basically the the poverty line in your state based on your household size they'll look at that and they'll make a calculation based on that and based on your income of how much um you should be paying and some people end up paying zero or you know 10 bucks a month or whatever you make that payment on time every month um i believe it's nine on-time payments in 10 months okay you do that every month and then that loan is brought out of default the derogatory is removed the default and it's now you can move it over to a different servicer. And then now you can go into income base for payment or any plan you want. So you could bring it out of default. And right now, I mean, it, that may be coming to an end, but you know, if in 2020 or 21, technically the amount owed or that had to be paid because of COVID and the CARES Act was zero. So basically you could bring the loan out of default by going to your lender, telling them you wanted to do this and not paying anything because there was no amount required to be paid because of that. Um, but in traditional times, it'll be, you pay a small amount for, you know, nine, 10, 10 months, nine times on time, and then uh, you're out of default. So it, it's very effective. The thing I think we run into is folks who, oh, they want to buy a home right now. And it's like, okay, if the, if the loan being default is an issue, there's no way to expedite it, you know? Um, well, because it's basically credit that has to be paid. And yeah. so that's, that's, that's kind of one of those, that's one place where it's very hard to overcome because yeah. lender is going to want you to pay it. We're going to charge, we're going to basically account for you having to pay it. Um, and so it can, it can really drastically reduce what you qualify for. It can also make it just really difficult for us to, um, to show you as a, as a good credit risk. And th those defaults will tank your credit score. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's the reality. I mean, um, I've seen credit card credit reports that have multiple credit cards that are good, but they've got a couple of defaulted loans. And I mean, they really have trouble breaking past maybe 610 if they're lucky. And, you know, I mean, truth be told for a lot of what people want, uh, certainly here in Southern California, it's, you're gonna have a tough time, you know, with a score like that. And so I think the biggest, I guess this goes to the broader lesson here, which is being prepared and sort of thinking ahead because Obviously, by the time, say, they came to you, Fiona, or to Sammy, y'all will have plenty of solutions you come up with, but needless to say, or the same thing goes for us, but not all of those solutions are things that are going to work in 30 yeah. or 60 days, and if that's what you need, it's better to say, hey, I'm a year out, and I give a lot of credit. I mean, there's a lot of people who came to us and later end up buying a home, and I give, I give so much credit to them for being so realistic and saying, you know what, I'd like to buy a house. And I had someone who signed, I think we had someone, I was looking at the notes who signed up recently. They want to buy a house in the early, late summer or early fall of 2023. Okay. So they've got over a year and it won't take that long, but their scores in the high 500s and they want it to be higher. And I'm like, okay, that's a totally realistic goal. But when you try to jump in sooner is when it happens. Cause like the student loan default, there's nothing we can do to make the nine months faster, right? Mm -hmm. um, so point being but, just- But by the same token, like don't stick your head in the sand. Yeah, and exactly. Then, 
don't don't take, procrastinate yeah don't procrastinate take care of it when you when it comes up you know um and we actually see one of the clients that sammy and i had recently um you wouldn't know this or who it is sammy but um they just randomly had a situation like this where the loan had um it was it's actually in collections and um it fell into one of those forgiven they got a letter while we were in process that the loan was forgiven and it was kind of one of those things where i was like wow these people are just totally like lucky i mean it was lucky i couldn't even believe it they sent me the letter i was like is this real <laughs> Yeah. But um, that does not happen very often. But yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of um, if you think you want to buy a house in any in a year, you need to be consulting people today, um, especially if yeah. you think you might have some issues. It's an interesting question of like you know people saying like, oh, in the next like year I'm gonna buy, and I'm like, okay, well, I don't want you to call me in a year and then be like okay, I'm ready now to start the process because I'm like, well, but there could have been a lot happening in that year that we don't know about. And it does kind of speak to that question, Shiva, where you're like, well, I mean, if somebody's with you, you already know what's up with their credit. But, um, and so it's sort of that catch-22. It's like, well, you don't want them already working with a lender and then basically getting denied, but you also want them you know, in the past, like yeah. at least having a conversation, because um, sometimes Fiona will catch a credit issue that, I mean, they didn't know, or mm -hmm. um, so then it's like, okay, well, let's hold off. But if we had waited, we wouldn't have, exactly. you know, like we wouldn't have caught it and we would have yeah. had that time. So I guess it's an interesting Or they didn't realize of, what the impact of that was on their school. Or yeah. yeah, right, yeah. Well, and then I guess that is a question, like speaking of tracking um, and tracking your bank accounts and expenses. I mean, I know a lot of people use apps, Credit Karma, stuff like that. I know from you two that that's not really the way <laughs> to track your credit. So how should somebody realistically be tracking their credit? Pay your bills. <laughs> so that, that's the, yeah, the, the first, so I'll say this with Credit Karma. Credit Karma is a very good app in the sense of knowing if you pay something late, right, it will appear on Credit Karma that you paid it 30 days or more late, or a new collection shows up on, on TransUnion or Equifax, it will show up on there. So from that standpoint, it is really good. The thing that is not explained well enough on the part of Credit Karma and I mean, it was a business decision and it would seem to be a wise one considering they sold the company for seven or $8 billion. Um, they give you the Vantage score and the Vantage score is not the same as the FICO score, which like Fiona and other lenders would be using. And it's not the same as the mortgage FICO score, two, four, and five, right? There's many versions of FICO. So your credit karma score can often be higher, but at least a third of the time it's lower. I've seen people who had a 630 on Credit Karma and their mortgage pull was a 670. But most times your, your Credit Karma score is higher. And so folks sometimes get an inflated sense of where their credit is versus what the reality is. And it's not just with, with mortgages. It happens when they go buy a car or get business funding or apply for credit cards. Credit Karma said they had a 710, but their real FICO that American Express saw was a 685 and they don't want that. You know, So check Credit Karma once a month and don't, don't pay much attention to the score. Pay attention to your utilization, meaning how much of your credit card balances you're using and any negatives, meaning did you have any late payments or anything like that? Hopefully not. That's what you wanna do, but there's three credit bureaus, right? So Credit Karma gives you Equifax and TransUnion. They don't give you Experian and Experian doesn't really work that much with any outside provider, but you can get a free account at Experian.com. They'll always try to push you to upgrade to a paid one, but you don't have to. Get a free account with Experian.com. And your third report is Experian. And Experian is the biggest of the three credit bureaus. So like I know of collection agencies that only report to Experian, but mm -hmm. don't report to the other two. So you really should also get fr free Experian account and check on there and just make sure everything looks good. So for me, I, I go in Credit Karma, you know, myself once a month, twice a month, see what's there. I go on Experian at least a couple times a month, see what I have there. And Experian actually gives you a FICO score, not your mortgage FICO, but a FICO. So it's more representative of where you generally fall. I think they give you FICO 8, 
um, which is a little more lax than the mortgage FICO, but not by that much. So check those two apps just once a month, maybe put it on your calendar on Google or Apple or whatever, and just keep track of it. I mean, honestly, if you monitor your credit and monitor your bills, that's the number one. That's not the cure-all because, I mean, I see a lot of people come to us because of divorce, because a business failed, because they lost a job, because of medical issues. Those are all those things that happen in life. If though You can't prevent those and no app is going to get you out of those. But just for day-to-day -day management, those slip-ups like, oh, I forgot my credit card and it went late. Those kind of things can be avoided to some degree by keeping an eye on, on credit monitoring. Yeah. Super helpful. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, just that's sort of hitting like the, the middle band of generally, you know, not, you know, nothing's wrong. You're also just, you're just like, what's a good way to track it? And it's, that's great advice. I mean, what, so I would just end like with what is the one thing you're just like repeating to your clients over and over again about lending or credit or, you know, anything financial that well, you're like, I, I, if I could say this right now, like I'm always telling people. The, the biggest thing is just, you know, pay your bills on time and keep your credit card balances low. And I can't tell you how many people, unfortunately, in our program, it happens less because we, we keep sending them text messages and emails from our system about it. But you do have a lot of folks who, I, I'll never forget one of our clients who we removed three collections for them, okay? And they had four or five. So they were almost done. Three collections, this was in the first couple months. And then they went and paid, to, they went and paid their credit card late that month which again, tanked the score, it, it offset, because the, the collections were all three or four years old, the late was brand new, it pretty much offset the work we did. And I mean, needless to say, it's disappointing for them. And we felt bad for them in the sense of it's unfortunate, but it was a consistent pattern. So just pay things on time because it, just pay, that's the number one thing that's gonna keep your score good or not. If you don't know anything, but you just say, I know I had to pay my bills on time and not have my credit cards go crazy. There's a lot of people like, I don't know, like my parents, for example. Um, I don't think they've ever used any of those apps to check their credit, but mm -hmm. the fact that they just pay on time does it. So pay things on time and understand, and this is more specific to credit repair, keep in mind that it is a process. Um, if you have multiple derogatories on your credit, and I mean, I know I've met clients from Fiona and Sammy and a lot of other folks who do. If you do have derogatories, yeah, maybe you get lucky and they get removed in a few months and that happens, believe me, it does. But very often you should assume this will be a six to nine or six to 10 month process, um, which is something that unfortunately, I don't think a lot of credit repair companies or others will sometimes tell people that. It, it really is a process. And if you if your, if your credit went bad, it's not going to go up overnight. It's going to take time and effort. The good news is, here's like the best thing about it. If you literally do nothing with your credit, you're just like, you know what? I have all these lates, all these charge-offs, all this stuff. I'm not going to do anything. You do face lawsuit risk. Some of those creditors could sue you. But aside from that, you do nothing. All of them will fall off in seven years. Now, I don't think that's a wise course of action because seven years is a heck of a long time in anyone's life. I mean, who knows, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, right? I think you should take care of it. But even if you do nothing, there's still hope for you and that your credit basically resets every seven years. So that's always a positive. And time, time heals. <laughs> yeah, it does. It truly does. Is that a broken clock is right twice a day. Yep, <laughs> yep that's exactly. You just do nothing, but yeah, but, but, but start paying on time and then it'll just fall. Yeah, yeah. If you just start yeah. paying on time, I mean, we have, we have people with a lot of lates. Like I see people online, especially who ask questions. They have a lot of lates and charge offs and collections from five and a half years ago and they want to do credit repair. And I'm like, listen, okay, if you really need to buy a house like in the next year, then maybe. But if you can wait 18 months, why not just keep building credit and let all this stuff fall off? It'll all be gone and then your score will be pristine. And he didn't need to do all this. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Fiona. All right. The one thing. Oh, my God. Okay. So, my one thing, my one piece of advice to the world <laughs> when you go and you buy a pair of jeans at the gap, or you go and you go to Old Navy, do not get suckered by saving 10% to open up the card for the store. It's literally, 
Macy's is like the worst too. Like those are the, those, if there's one thing that I see over and over and over again, that is an issue, it's the, it's the size of the credit limit on those. The minute you open one of those up, it, if it's 500 bucks, it quashes you. You're good. You, if they, if they say they want you to open up a credit card, say, yes, I will do it. I would like a $10,000 limit. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not doing it. Sure. <laughs> no, that's, that's the one sure. thing I see a lot of that gets people into trouble is those little store cards. Don't do it. This and is not it, worth it. This is another thing to Fiona's point. Keep in mind, um, those cards with the small limits and the small balances often have annual fees. And if you forget those, then you're going to go late. I mean, um, I have seen people with charged off cards from like TJ Maxx, okay, Synchrony Bank, um, stuff like that. And what happened? It came with a $30 annual fee. They use it for two purchases, Banana Republic, and they forgot about it. And they didn't pay the annual fee. And then it went 30, 60, 90. And at some point they saw, or they just saw it on their credit later when it was six months charged off. And now it's taken your score down. And, and just in general, the more you're applying for credit, you're gonna hurt yourself because your age of accounts goes down each time. And you have a credit inquiry, I mean, I definitely have seen folks who like went and randomly opened a couple credit cards and they have great credit, but those inquiries ding them and then they're applying for a mortgage like four months later or three months later and those inquiries are hitting their score a little bit. And just be very, be very careful in applying for credit. That's all. And if you have credit yeah. karma, this is a big tip. If you have credit karma, be careful with their recommendations because a lot of the cards they suggest are not mm -hmm. actually ones you may qualify for. They get paid mm -hmm. if you if you get approved, then you right. sign up. So their incentive is to just push you to apply as much as you can. So just be aware of that. Yeah, totally. Check those credit limits. I, I learned something new today about all those store cards because they do tell you what you qualify for. So you could apply and then if it's super low, you know, that could be a moment to like say no. Um, and then another thing, sometimes I've had, I've like applied for cards with, this, with the fees, you know, um, mm -hmm. just to get like points or a bonus. And sometimes you can either call, you know, and cancel it so you're not getting this annual fee. But sometimes I've been able to like downgrade the card to one of their cards that doesn't have an annual fee. So I get to keep that line of credit open. Um, so that's another strategy too, is like instead of canceling, but just try to like lower your fees <laughs> and just like tracking things that could get lost. Because um, we're busy, like who's going to pay attention to that $30 TJ Maxx thing that's so annoying. Um, but yeah, that's great advice. True Bill reminds you when you have True Bill. I know that's like the main thing. True is, Bill. Is, uh, these random subscriptions that we all have. But. It was like I have like right a renewal on now. something, like, and it gives you yeah. like a like a, like a 15 day warning. Yeah. And I was like, oh McAfee. I'm like, I haven't used that, I haven't used the computer that that McAfee program is on in like two years, <laughs> but I keep paying to renew it. <laughs> it's so 90s um oh my God. but yeah no totally I mean I love that um and I would say I mean I would say in terms of like my advice the uh, is kind of related to this is just like have good advisors on your team um no matter what you're trying to do start a business like you know there's all the stuff you can do yourself right like we talked about tracking your credit doing your own budget finances like just kind of maintaining the basics but like at a certain point if you need help with credit like I mean do you know how to like call and try to get these things off like maybe you can DIY some stuff but it's kind of helpful to reach out to someone like Shiva who's doing like hundreds of these a day. I don't know, thousands maybe, <laughs> but um, you know, and Fiona, like who can talk through, okay, here's all your different lending options. We've mentioned like financial planner, insurance, like different sort of people who know what they're talking about and can do that and have your best interest in mind. I mean, always be aware of like what, someone is selling you and that's fine obviously Fiona makes money doing loans and Shiva makes money if you take stuff off your credit and I make money if you buy a house but like you know I think you can sort of tell like when someone's really trying to help you figure out what you're trying to do and I think that's been 
my number one advice to people is like have good people on your team because you don't there's no way you're gonna know how to do everything um and we can help you figure out like okay what's the best strategy for you in your specific situation oh absolutely good deal yeah well um the information for all of us it will be in the um replay uh, description um so you can get in touch i know all three of us are happy to talk to anybody who's curious and wants to invest in real estate or whatever you're trying to do and need um you know some advice but any things you want to share any last words it'll all work out you know i mean <laughs> that sounds like the most cliche time heals <laughs> I mean, time heals Right. I mean, it's uh, Pay your bills. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it, it, it all, I mean, I, I'm a, you know, I, I can say from having, I had a 514 credit score at one point. Okay. Right. And now, I mean, I have a, I don't know, I think at least 70, 70 or 70. And so the point being that it's, it's very possible to get there, just change your habits and your mindset around it and things can get better without a doubt. I love that. Sure. Well, thank you all. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. This is really sure. helpful. Yeah. Reach out anytime. Absolutely. Yeah. We're Bye. all available. <laughs> Bye.